We are joined by former Prime Minister of Israel and current leader of the opposition, Benjamin Netanyahu. Thank you so much for coming to our studios here at I24 News. Well, thank you. Good to see you. Now, uh, we're going to talk about the Iran deal. The JCPOA uh, was far from perfect, uh, but now the world is about to sign off on a far weaker, far shorter deal. Iran is enriching up to 60%. They're about to be showered with billions of dollars in sanctions relief. And on top of that, you've got a far more hardline president in Tehran. Uh, you encouraged the Americans to quit the deal. Was that a mistake? No, it was the only thing that was right. Because the only thing that will work with Iran is not to give it a deal that the old deal already paved Iran's path to the bomb. The new deal is even worse. It allows Iran, with a seal of international approval, to enrich uranium in an unlimited fashion. It feeds them with billions of dollars to continue their terror campaigns in the Middle East and around the world. The deal is horrible. In fact, Iran would get to the bomb by keeping the deal. So the deal is useless. What really you need to do is to apply crippling sanctions and uh, a credible military threat to Iran to make sure that it dismantles its nuclear uh, enrichment programs, its underground bunkers, its ballistic missiles that are meant to bring uh, its nuclear arsenal to everywhere in the world, to Europe, to the United States, to everywhere else. So if you want to stop Iran, this deal is not the way to stop it. The way to stop it is by overwhelming pressure. And that's what I asked the United States to do, the previous administration, and that's what it did. Well, on my show, Middle East Now, uh, I, I speak to a lot of Saudis, Emiratis, Bahrainis, um, mm -hmm. and, and they have as much to fear from Iran as we do. Uh, they've accepted that the, the maximum pressure campaign of Donald Trump didn't work, and they are now all talking to Iran in one way or another. Uh, Israel seems to be alone, the only country standing up to this regime. Is that sustainable? Well, yes, it's sustainable and it's necessary, because sometimes the whole world caves in before uh, a terrible dictatorship. We've seen that happen in the 20th century. Uh, everybody went there and, you know, and in Munich, uh, as Churchill said, they chose uh, dishonor over war. They got both. They got war with dishonor. You cannot give uh, uh, a dictatorship like Iran that uh, seeks uh, death to the U.S., uh, death to Israel, and wants to subjugate all the Muslims in the world and conquer chunks of the world. You cannot give it nuclear weapons and with the means to deliver them. You can't give them intercontinental ballistic missiles that can reach any city in the world with uh, nuclear tip weapons. You want to give the Ayatollahs nuclear weapons? That's what this deal does. So you have to stand up to it. And if Israel is alone in standing up to it, I certainly, as Prime Minister, had no compunction about that. I said I will do anything with a deal or without a deal to prevent Iran from having nuclear weapons. And I meant it. But if Iran you mean it, people will follow you. If you don't mean it, they won't. Okay, but Iran has, has been subject to some of the strongest sanctions ever imposed on any regime ever for several years, and it has still managed to advance its nuclear program uh, to at an alarming rate. Isn't it fair to say that the, the maximum pressure campaign simply did not work? Well, what do you think would have happened if you didn't have it? They would have already had, according to the uh, chief of the uh, uh, IAEA, who came to Israel in the uh, early uh, 2000s, I think 2005, he said, there's nothing you can do. By six years from now, uh, Iran will have nuclear weapons. Well, that would have been 2011 or 2012. Now, we're 10 years later. They don't have it. They don't have it because we led, and I pushed uh, very strongly for it, for not only for strong sanctions against Iran, but occasionally for actions against Iran's nuclear program, which I won't detail here. You know what we did, among other things. We sent the Mossad into the heart of Tehran, brought back their secret nuclear archive that shows that they were lying through their teeth to the world. These actions, uh, operational actions, economic sanctions, uh, and the threat of a credible uh, military action is what held back Iran's program for 10 years. They would have had it. Now, you can't say because it didn't work completely, let's call it off completely. Let's give Iran whatever it wants, which is what, you know, pave a highway of gold to a nuclear arsenal, which is what this horrible deal is going to do. You have to get back to the right program. The right program is sanctions, strong sanctions, operational actions, and 
All right. Incredible military. But there's a big flaw in the maximum pressure campaign, isn't there? Um, and that is China, because China consistently undermined the sanctions uh, on Iran. It invested billions no, I don't think in so. Iran. And if the West continues to shun Iran, that is another unintended consequence, isn't it? Because that relationship, that toxic relationship, which poses a threat to us all, will get stronger. Uh, Laura, I have to tell you something. If America is strong on sanctions, everybody, including China, falls in line. You know why? Because when companies and governments have to choose between an economy that is about the size of Israel's economy, that's the Iranian economy, it's because Israel, which is, you know, uh, 10 times smaller, has enormous uh, GDP per capita, but Iran doesn't. So when you have to choose between a tiny, uh, a rather small economy like Iran's or a gigantic economy like the U.S. with uh, dozens of uh, trillions of dollars, you know, everybody falls in place. The reason sanctions don't work is because if you lift those sanctions, which unfortunately the United States has just done with some of them, then everybody says, okay, we can go on do, doing business with Iran. If you're strong and you, can, you make it even stronger, then other people come through because they have to choose. It's Iran or America. And they always invariably choose America economically. Okay, now um, you mentioned uh, the current uh, U.S. administration. You, of course, famously had a very close relationship with the previous American president, uh, Donald Trump. Um, there isn't the same relationship between the current government and the Biden administration. Uh, is the U.S. listening to Israel's concerns? Well, uh, first of all, I hope Israel is voicing those concerns because we all should. Because, yeah, we're, we're the first target, but every, the rest of the world is really the next target. Uh, I, I think that the, uh, uh, you know, the, the important thing is what is the right policy and what is the wrong policy, not who's doing it. You know, when I uh, saw American uh, uh, administrations over the years adopt policies that I thought were inimical or dangerous to my country, I opposed them. Sometimes they were Republican, sometimes they were Democrats. So I think the issue is not the identity of the uh, administration, but the policies. And the policy now, I think, is weak, and the right policy, from Israel's point of view, should be to speak out against it. Look, I went, Laura, to the U.S. Congress to speak out against a sitting American president. I didn't do that lightheartedly. I knew that I was doing something unprecedented. But I knew the survival of my country, and in my opinion, the survival of many countries, was at stake. So I did it. I spoke at U.N. forums. I spoke on... Endless television interviews. I did everything I could to mobilize the Senate and the Congress uh, against this, what I thought was a dangerous agreement for the U.S., for Israel, and for everyone else. Uh, that's what I think should be done now. If it'll be done now, people will pay attention. Nobody will be more pro-Israel than the Israelis themselves. No one will be more passionate, uh, more committed than Israel itself. So we have to communicate that passion, that commitment, that uh, willingness to face these threatening odds, however dreadful. Uh, and if we do it, others will follow. You yes. only, they only follow if you lead. You certainly pursued a, a very aggressive and energetic diplomatic campaign um, against Iran during your time in power. Uh, when you look back, do you ever regret not using the military option, going it alone against Iran? And if so, when would you have sent in the IDF? Well, I can't relay everything that I sure. uh, that we were trying to do. We've done many things over the years. Some of them you've read about. Some of them you haven't. Uh, and I think those actions actually held back the Iranian program. Those who say, well, you know, look at how far Iran has gone. Iran would have been with a nuclear arsenal, with a hundred or maybe dozens of nuclear bombs, if we hadn't done everything that we did, both operationally but also politically and economically. Uh, and I think it's time to do more. Was there a moment that we could have done other things? Yeah, but you have to get it passed. This is, uh, uh, I'm not a monarch. Even those who say King Bibi, uh, no, uh, you have to get elected. Uh, and uh, besides getting elected, you have to have a majority for your decisions. I couldn't pass all the decisions that I wanted to. And I think in retrospect, people can see maybe that uh, uh, what is needed is a consistent, consistent, uh, aggressive action against the most aggressive, poisonous, poisonous regime on the planet. You don't want ayatollahs with nuclear weapons. Okay, so 
the common fear of Iran in the region helped you to make history. Uh, mm. You um, managed to get uh, Arab countries in the region to sign normalization accords, the Abraham Accords with Israel. Uh, are you satisfied with the way those accords are progressing under the current Israeli government? I think it's great. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not a credit taker. I don't care about that. I mean, I always believe that if we, uh, that really there were two things that had to happen. Okay, three. The first thing is to get rid of the Palestinian veto. Everybody said, oh, you're, you're not going to break out to the Arab world until you have peace with the Palestinians. John Kerry famously said that, didn't he? Yeah, he did. But, but peace with the Palestinians is not going to happen right away because the Palestinians don't want a peace with Israel. They want a, a state next instead of Israel, not next to Israel. So they'll veto any peace, which is what they were doing for a quarter of a century. We had to get rid of the Palestinian veto and to recognize that it's not that a Palestinian breakthrough will open the Arab world, it may be the other way around. And that was the first thing. The second thing that you needed was the impetus, uh, a negative impetus, I would say, of Iran that you talked about, because people saw, especially after my speech in Congress, that I was willing to, if necessary, even confront the President of the United States uh, a great ally. But for the sake of preventing Iran's nuclear ambitions, uh, they understood that Israel was a great ally. And so the Gulf states came closer to Israel at that point because they're under the Iranian nuclear gun just like we are. And the third thing that had to happen was a positive impetus, impetus and that is the, the promise of Israeli technology and water and uh, health and uh, 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 cyber and everything. Okay, I mean, they really saw that there are opportunities there for, to better the lives of their people. And the three things, those three things, I think uh, the, the fact that, uh, uh, that they, we overcame the Palestinian veto, that they uh, could see the ability to defend against Iran through an alliance with Israel and the, uh, the great benefits to their peoples, that clinched it. And that's why the groundwork for Iran's, for the great uh, change in the Abraham Accords was really laid out already in 2015. Okay, just very briefly, uh, just to go back to our first point then, uh, it looks like a deal with Iran might be imminent, uh, according to reports coming out of Vienna. Uh, what, is, what is your advice then to, to those taking part in negotiations? Walk away? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I said that to them all the time. Or demand a better deal. A deal that doesn't, that uh, forces Iran to dismantle its nuclear, uh, its military nuclear infrastructure, that doesn't let them develop their ballistic missiles to deliver a weapon that stops weapon development, that stops terror, that ties the progress in lifting restrictions on Iran to Iran's behavior, not to the change of calendar, which is what this deal does. So I, I think, yes, that's what I would advise. But again, I would say that from my point of view, as the uh, uh, having been the prime minister of Israel against these kinds of deals for a long time, the most important thing to say is with a deal or without a deal, Israel must do what it needs to do to defend itself against the threat, this ex extraordinary threat to its existence and its future. Benjamin Netanyahu, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.